Hello and welcome. We are so delighted that you joined us for the Symposium on Person-Centered Approaches in Elder Abuse Multidisciplinary Teams today. I am Madge Haynes, the Associate Director of Engagement and Partnerships at the Full Frame Initiative. We are a national social change organization and our North Star is a country where everyone has a fair shot at well-being. For over a year now, it's been our privilege and our pleasure to partner with Dr. Laura Mosqueda and the team here at USC. We've been sharing our well-being framework and design principles for this project. I'm here with my colleague, Lotus Yu, Senior Manager of Engagement and Partnerships. Today, we're supporting facilitation and Lotus will primarily be off camera today managing tech. As I cover a few housekeeping notes, please share your name, organization, and where you're located in the chat so we have a sense of who's here today. Um, and so here are the housekeeping notes for today. Um, as you've noticed already, all attendees will enter the meeting in listen-only mode. Um, we would have a variety of speakers and uh, panel that we will be sharing with you today and um, invite you um, to comment, react, send questions if you have any to the panelists um, using the Q&A function. And um, if you are um, uh, would like to use the live transcript feature, please click the CC button and that should start the service. Um, the recording and presentation materials from today will be sent via email. So you will can look forward to that after the uh, symposium. And absolutely your feedback matters. So after we conclude today's webinar, uh, there will be a link that we ask you that you follow that link to complete the survey. I'm excited about uh, the group of speakers and panelists um, we will hear from today. So let me first provide you a bit of information about each of them. Laura Mosqueda, MD, is a senior advisor in the National Center on Elder Abuse and Professor of Me Family Medicine and Geriatrics at the Keck School of Medicine of USC. Dr. Mosqueda is a geriatrician and widely respected authority on elder abuse and care of older adults and the underserved. Her unique perspective is informed by her extensive experiences as a clinician, researcher, community educator, and role as a volunteer long-term care ombudsman. She co-founded the nation's first elder abuse forensic center in 2006, which served as a model for the Federal Elder Justice Act. Patty Kimball, MSMS, is executive director of the Elder Abuse Institute of Maine. Ms. Kimball's diverse roles have included direct service provider, community organizer, consultant, and administrator. Ms. Kimball's leadership in driving the evidence-based RISE model, which is designed to reduce harm, respect autonomy, restore relationships, and advance justice in a more holistic and flexible way than the usual systems are structured to do, and advocating for restorative justice, has received national acclaim and inspired replication. Tara Patet, uh, JD. Senior Prosecutor with the City Attorney's Office in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, Ms. Patet has been a prosecutor for 30 years, specializing in domestic violence and elder abuse cases. Ms. Patet develops and conducts national training for the Department of Justice, Office of Violence Against Women, and National Clearinghouse on Abuse in Later Life. In addition, Ms. Patet conducts domestic violence and elder abuse best practices training for prosecutors and is a faculty member and instructor for the National Institute on the Prosecution of Elder Abuse. Margaret Carson, MAGMHS, LMHC, is program manager at Muckleshoot Indian Tribe. Ms. Carson has worked with elders for over 40 years through community mental health and crisis intervention programs and adult protective services. In 2011, she began working with the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe and assisted them to develop their tribal APS program after they enacted their Elder Abuse Protection Code and has served as their program manager since 2016. And lastly, Zach Gasumis, PhD, is Assistant Professor of Family Medicine and Gerontology at the Keck School of Medicine of USC. Dr. Gasumis conducts research into various aspects of quality of life for older adults, 
with a primary focus on elder abuse, caregiving, and health and social services. His most recent research projects investigate service provision by Adult Protective Services, mandated reporting of elder abuse to APS, elder abuse in people with dementia, caregiver support intervention, and elder abuse MDT models. What an amazing group. Um, I'm honored to be in this space with them and of course with all of you today. Um, our agenda includes interactive polling, which we'd like you to engage with as we move through the agenda. We will use Minimeter for this. And what it requires is that you click on the link that will be provided in the chat, type in your response, and then submit. So it asks you just to click on the Minimeter link that's provided in the chat and now enter your responses. Thank you for starting your responses. So we see more involvement from APS and law enforcement, um, consideration of dignity, of risk, more incorporation of the client's priorities and desired outcomes. Uh, I saw law enforcement, DA, how people do it since it's new to do for us. Interesting comments there. Thank you. More openness to inviting clients and their family members despite stubbornness or resistant personalities. More involvement in the community team during case staffings. These are excellent, excellent points and a variety of responses in terms of what people are interested in doing in their MDTs. Um, I also see more emotional support for survivors of romance and other scams, which happens too frequently. Um, more mental health services offered in rural areas and more involvement of police. Uh, more involvement uh, from those harder to get to the table. Um, law enforcement, mental health experts in LTC ombudsman. Thank you all for sharing. I ask you to please continue entering your thoughts here. A variety of reactions and responses and interests. And I hope um, as we move through the agenda today and you hear from our speakers and our panelists that uh, what you hear resonates with your interests and why you're here today and hopefully provide some new insights um, for you to carry forward and back with you to your MDTs. So we're now gonna move into the speaker's portion of the agenda. We're gonna start first with words from Dr. Laura Mosqueda. And Dr. Mosqueda, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you, Madge. It's been a pleasure to work with you and the uh, Full Frame Initiative. Uh, been wonderful partners. Um, we wanna first thank the, uh, the our funders for all of this. We're very grateful to the office for uh, for victims of crime through Office of Justice Programs and the DOJ, Department of Justice. Um, let's go to the next slide and just give you a little bit of an overview about why the heck are we even talking about all this? And part of it is that you know, person-centered care has become uh, maybe a buzzword, but it actually really has a lot of meaning. I think to most people, it seems obvious um, when we're talking about healthcare that we want to involve our patients. I'm saying patients because I'm a physician in what's important to them and understanding how they want their care to be provided and, and how to involve them in their own good health. And this, is, this has gone on to many other fields who are working with this idea of person-centeredness. And it really struck me as somebody who's been kind of an at the beginning of, of working in some of these MDTs, like, wow, I've really missed the boat when, when it comes to person-centeredness in multidisciplinary teams. And we need to understand this more and better and see what the possibility, how is it possible for us to really integrate 
what the people were serving for the people were serving, what it is that they want, what are their preferences and their values when it comes to these conversations we're having in a multidisciplinary team. And at least in my experience, often without the voice of that person present. So the first thing we did was try to understand it a little bit more. And we had a, a consensus convening in May of 2023. Um, and then we had uh, and I'll talk about the con consensus convening now, which was a two-day virtual convening. We had 25 professionals from a whole variety, kind of representative of what an MDT would look like. And they had been in practice from anywhere from four to almost 40 years, uh, had been working in multidisciplinary teams. And we asked them to help us identify key components of what a person-centered approach might look like, and what are some of the barriers and facilitators to implementation. So this was really kind of a think tanky kind of thing over a period of two days, again, with Full Frame Initiative helping us um, uh, facilitate and, and put the information together. And we then used what we learned there to launch a, uh, a questionnaire which we have on the next slide. And the national questionnaire went out um, to, uh, to everybody who wanted to participate. So we sent it to a lot of people. We got to close to 300 responses across 36 states. So as a researcher, that made my heart happy because that's a pretty good, good number of responses. Um, and we asked a lot of questions about concepts related to multidisciplinary teams, what do you think of it? Do you consider yourself uh, personally? Do you consider yourself as a profession? And how do you consider yourself as a multidisciplinary team when it comes to person-centered care? And what we found is that seven out of 10 thought that it was really important to know what an older adult's preferences were when we're having the MDT discussion. Um, and that we in some cases systematically, and in some cases it's a little more idiosyncratic or sporadic, collect information on what are the older adults' preferences? What are the older adults' capabilities, capacities? We'll be throwing some of these terms around quite a bit. And also, are you finding out about things like religious or spiritual views uh, that, that the older adult who's being discussed uh, may have? Next slide, please. So that's what people wanted. Um, but when it came to practice, um, and we started asking people, okay, well, this is what you believe. We majority think it's really important. How many of us are really doing this and how many of us are doing it well? And that's when the numbers go down. And had I been allowed to answer this survey, my numbers would have been going down on this as well, because I think it's important, but man, there's a lot of barriers to it. And I don't do a personally as good a job as, as I think I could be in, in part of the, in the MDT that I serve on. Interestingly though, some of our attitudes are that 69% thought it was inappropriate to include the older adult in the case discussion. Um, and that 25% um, said that they would prioritize what the older adult wants over their professional opinion, which means that most of the time we're really imposing our professional opinion on that of the older adult because we think we are. And look, we're going to get into this. This is not going to be uh, just sort of a everybody go along to get along kind of conversation. We're really going to ask our, our experts to talk a little bit about what they're doing. And then uh, my job is to be the skunk at the picnic on all this and say, that's nice, but you know, when somebody has advanced dementia, what are we supposed to do? And really get into some of the nitty gritty, some of the barriers that we've heard about in order to understand what we might be able to do to move the needle on this. And indeed, there's a lot of barriers. So let's go to the next slide about some of the barriers and facilitators that we heard about. We heard about a few facilitators, but as you can see, we heard a lot more about the barriers. So. Facilitators are people are interested in improving the lives of the older adult and preserving their relationships. And we're, I think we saw this in the first Mentimeter that Madge did. People are really interested in alternatives. And we'll hear a little bit about the alternatives uh, to legal interventions, things like supported decision-making um, in a few minutes. 
But what are some of the barriers? Well, for many older adults, there's a real distrust of government, uh, and particularly law enforcement. So on the one hand, many of us on MDTs would like to have more law enforcement and involvement in better ways. And on the other side, we're hearing from some of the people we serve that they're afraid of law enforcement for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and so this you know, leads to a lot of fear and disincentives to engage with legal processes. Uh, and we have to recognize the diverse population that all of us serve. There's also barriers related to just our MDT protocols. Um, who's responsible for this in an MDT, right? Um, and we all have different methods of how we, of how our MDTs function, but really who's responsible, who needs to keep bringing person-centered practices to the fore? Um, are there any protocols, some kind of, kind of sort of have protocols related to person-centered care, others don't? Um, and then there's a lot of organizational barriers. Um, how familiar are we with person-centeredness and how do we apply the lens. Um, and if an older adult is doing something, making a choice that is clearly unsafe to us, how do we integrate what it is they want um, into the multidisciplinary team process? Is there enough time to figure all this out? I mean, gosh, sometimes we have a number of, of situations being presented and we only have so much time to go over them, but they can be really quite complicated. And now we want to put person-centeredness in the middle of all this too. And that can make it just logistically difficult. There's also a perception that many of us have that including the older adult um, maybe wouldn't be effective, maybe wouldn't be welcomed. Um, and, um, and that there are some cultures where that actually would definitely not be welcome. That's not considered okay to do. So we need to really understand cultural perceptions, the older adults' perceptions. Um, and we also, I think, need to have, mm, turn a turn 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 our finger instead of pointing out to also pointing in and say, how much of this might be a bias that I have? Um, how much of it is a real barrier and how much of it is a perceived barrier. So kind of taking a hard look at ourselves as well, I think is, is pretty important to do. All right, well, with that as sort of a, a backdrop, um, in a moment, we're gonna turn it over to our wonderful speakers and, um, and then I'll be uh, facilitating the panel. Um, if you have questions, please do use the uh, Q&A feature, which we'll be trying to monitor we can save Q&A until the end, but I'd be really happy. Um, I feel like your family, even though it's because quite a few of us here. So, you know, let's just make it a messy family dinner table and talk over each other a little bit in a polite way. So if you have questions as you're hearing information being presented, toss it in the, the Q&A. And if we're able to, we'll integrate it in real time into what we're, what we're talking about. So rather than waiting for Q&A till the end, We'll do our best to accommodate folks as we as we go along. And we have some exciting announcements toward the end. So stick with us, everybody. Um, it is now my absolute pleasure to uh, turn this uh, this virtual podium over to my friend and colleague, uh, Patty Kimball, to get us started off. Patty. Thank you, Dr. Mosqueda. It's um, a pleasure to be here and I appreciate the invitation to um, share my perspective and my work, um, which, uh, which exists in the agency of the Elder Abuse Institute of Maine around person-centered um, approaches to uh, elder justice and specifically in MDTs. So um, I uh, have the pleasure of being the executive director of a statewide nonprofit agency and our, in the state of Maine, our primary purpose is to provide services um, to folks who are at risk um, or experiencing um, abuse, uh, exploitation, or neglect. Um, we do this through a variety of programs, and one of the programs that um, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about today is, is the RISE program. Um, which was mentioned in my bio. I won't go too much into it because we have 10 minutes. Um, be glad to talk to anybody about the RISE program and our approach um, at a different time, but just wanna make sure that you know that our person-centered work is really um, 
grounded in a framework, and that framework is the RISE model. Um, we serve a, a folks that are referred to us from APS. We are a statewide program. We have advocates that work out of remote offices across the state of Maine. We launched the program in uh, 2019 and have served um, over 900 people um, to date. Uh, next slide. And that's just to give you a little bit of context. So my hope today um, in my 10 minutes, and I will um, pay attention to the time, um, I could talk about this for hours as I'm sure we all could, um, is to give you a, a little bit of a switching of the framework from, from person-centered to a, a different sort of lens, maybe to look, look at this through, so to uh, talk a little bit about why, why it's important, which I know you all, you wouldn't be here if you didn't know it was important, but just sort of to get us all on the same page and maybe why it is challenging. Um, and to offer in, in, uh, in response to the challenges, maybe a framework that helps us think about how to put uh, uh, person-centered practices into practice, um, and then share a little bit about our outcomes, um, uh, just to sort of show you potentially the outcomes from a, a, a person-centered approach. I will say that we are um, person-centered practices and approaches are really baked into um, into our program. We use four modalities, motivational interviewing, supported decision-making, teaming, and restorative justice. And sort of um, embedded in all of those practices is a very person-centered mindset. So that is the framework for, for our program. But beyond those modalities, we are constantly thinking about um, how to be better at person-centered work, how to challenge ourselves, and what it really looks like in practice. So the first thing I'd say is when, when you think about person-centered work, I'm a very visual person. So I, I when I Google person-centered work, I often see a person in the middle um, and sort of people surrounding um, that potentially are what we would think of as our client. That is one way to think about person-centered work. But for me, um, I think about power differentials. I think about um, the attention a, a person may or may not want focused on them. I think about one individual in the middle of a group of experts and professionals, and it gives me the willies a little bit. So next slide. Another way to think about it, um, I'm not suggesting we change the language, but I am suggesting maybe we change the visual in our head. The other way to think about it is that the person is in the lead. Um, this, it, it, it may mean the same thing in practice. Um, it also, I think, dismantles the notion that person-centered work literally has to mean the person in the middle of a process. Um, I like to think about it as we take our lead from our clients and they direct the work that we're going to do as much as that is sort of legally and ethically possible, um, our clients are in the lead. So for me, that really switches, um, switches the frame a little bit. Next slide, please. So again, I'm gonna tell you something, we're all here for the same reason. I'm not gonna share anything that you don't already know, um, but why do we, why, why, I'm always asking the why. Why are we, why are we um, encouraging? Why are we sold on? Why are we sort of turning ourselves into pretzels in some cases to try to do person-centered work? Well, you know, bottom line, it's the most respectful way to approach our work, right? It, up, it upholds choice agency, autonomy, which often have been taken away from the clients that we work with. So it restores respect, it restores dignity, and it upholds it. Um, it, it also improves processes for, for providing service. Um, it actually can improve systems when we embrace the practices of person-centered work. And finally, it, it improves outcomes. And I think our program and many of you um, that work in the field um, I would hope have similar outcomes, it really does, using a person-centered approach improves the outcomes, which is what we all want. Next slide, please. Um, here, I'm a, also a very pragmatic person. I love to build programs. I love to manage programs. I love to evaluate programs. So here's the pragmatic why. Um, why do we do this? And here's what we all know. Our goal is to help clients. That's why we're in this business. Just whatever our industry is, whatever our position is, whatever our area of expertise, we're here to help, right? Um, what we also know as a field is that people, our clients um, or potential clients don't easily accept help. Um, they aren't, and for various reasons, this could be a whole nother conversation that you all recognize. Somebody mentioned um, fear or distrust of law enforcement. People don't, and, and law enforcement's not the only agency, right? People don't 
our clients don't easily accept help. And when they do, they often drop out. So one of our sort of um, frames is that we want to get in the door, right? We want a foot in the door. Um, and once we get in the door, we want to stay in. So uh, uh, from a very pragmatic perspective, person-centered approaches work to help you get in the door and stay in the door. And we can only help if we, if we get in, if we stay in. Next slide, please. So why is it difficult? Um, uh, uh, Dr. Muscata talked a little bit about this, the responses from the surveys and the focus groups certainly um, highlighted this. It requires the adaption of multiple processes, right? It's not one and done. It's not one agency's responsibility. It's not one piece of paper. It's not one policy. Um, it takes time and attention. You really have to slow down and look at your pro processes and your practices and maybe unpack them a little bit and ask why you do the things you do. Um, which equals resources. And we all know we never have enough time. We never have enough time for attention and we don't have enough resources. So it is challenging. Um, and also, and this is the one I would I would really hold up as um, one worth sort of uh, exploring a little bit more. It challenges our, our notion of what helping means, right? We, um, a lot of us are in the helping profession because we want to, we want to fix people's problems. We want pro people's problems to be fixed. And we see ourselves as experts um, and helping means seeing a problem be fixed. But that problem may be one we identify, not necessarily the client. And so it really requires a little bit of a shift in how we think about helping. Um, and the bottom, the, the sort of the bubbles at the bottom are the, the, the reasons we all talk about why it's difficult because of risk, because of risk, because of risk. And that goes back to safety. Next slide, please. So uh, Laura Gilpin was a nurse and a poet and a hospital reformer. And I love this quote, it's too bad patient-centered care is not rocket science because if it was, we would be really good at it. So I think, I think that what this acknowledges is that when we move in this direction, it is a challenge. Um, and and uh, only when we accept the challenge and only when we identify the challenge and are able to sort of unpack it, are we able to find better ways forward. Um, next slide, please. So here's a framework. Here, I, I, I like frameworks, I like visuals, I like things that help me sort of compartmentalize um, solutions to problems. So here's what I would call the person-centered SOPs. If it is so difficult, how do we make it easier? And I would posit here's one way, maybe, possibly, um, person-centered uh, SOPs. And for SOPs, I'm, I'm thinking about structure, I'm thinking about operations, and I'm thinking about perspective. So those are, in my mind, that's the way I organize person-centered expertise. So what does that mean? Next slide, please. For structure, integrating person-centered approaches into the environment within which you work, right? So my environment, my agency as a community-based organization is very different from APS. It's very different from a prosecutor. It's very different from law enforcement. The things I may be able to do given my role, given, given the mission of my organization, given the statutes I work within may be different than a prosecutor. So understanding on your MDT who can do what is critically important. What are the structures you have in place to support doing um, it? Again, it's not one person's job um, and everybody can do a little. Some people can do more than, and, than others. Also looking at your own organization's ability to do person-centered work and really the parameters within which you work, um, but then collectively as an MDT, how, how do you look at the structure in which you operate? Um, and so I think of this as the architecture. So one of the ways to think about it is, what is the, does the architecture support doing person-centered work? Next slide, please. The second in the SOPs is operations. So it's great to have this theory of person-centered work. And I'm, I'm always saying to our staff, well, how are we operationalizing that? What does that actually look like in practice from referral to close? So one of the examples I use in our program is we have a very low barrier entry point. We have a very low barrier referral. Our referrals come from APS. We ask for very little information. And that's intentional because um, we don't, we, we challenge the notion that you need a lot of information about a client to engage in our program. Um, sometimes uh, clients will, will know that they have sort of a file on them. And if I go into a case with that file of information in my head, I'm less likely to see the person in front of me and really listen to what they're telling me about their life. So how do we operationalize from referral to intake forms, to assessments, to closure? What are the practices we use, the very granular practices that support, um, that support person-centered work? And this is ongoing, this is ongoing um, from engagement to close. Next slide, please. 
And finally, and again, I would hold this up as the one that we we all we we can all learn from and sort of um, challenge each other around is this, as, is a, a shift in perspective. Um, it, it, we talk to our staff a lot about what success means, right? Um, if you are taking a person-centered approach, your goal for that client, as we know, may not be the client's goal, and they may not end up in a place that we think is best for them. Um, and so I challenge you when we think what we think is best for people, right? That paternalistic approach. So success has to look a little bit different. Um, and we talk with our staff a lot about what to success in a, in a sort of normal job. What does success look like in this work that we do? How can we rethink what success looks like and what does helping mean? Um, what does it mean to be a helper? We want to run in and fix problems. We see people in distress. Um, what does it really mean to help? And if you are following a person's lead, um, and the problem again that you that you identify is not fixed. Are you helping? Um, and these are things that we we approach and, and question all the time. And I'll, I'll I'll sort of give this final pause on parsing out expertise. So we are in these professions, whatever our whatever our profession is, whatever our industry is, we are used to being experts, right? And I think person centered work. I know person centered work really means everybody is an expert. Um, and the expert in the case is really the client. And so there's a sense of humility and parsing out expertise and sort of seeing ourselves as equals um, in this process is really, really important. And switching that perspective, I think, is invaluable to, to part of the standard operating procedures for employing person-centered approaches. I'm closing shop now. So if anyone's panicking that I'm over, I'm almost done. One, one more slide, please. As I noted, we are um, we are very diligent in our work, try very hard to operationalize, put into structures and change our perspective to support person-centered work. And I think our outcomes um, are evidence of our, our somewhat of our success. I can't say we're always successful. Um, we have a 90% retention rate with our clients. Um, so clients don't often drop out of our program. Nearly 90% um, of our clients report being mostly or very satisfied with the services they receive and 80% reported they would definitely come back if they needed help again. Um, and I think those speak to, I know from, um, from honoring and watching this, the work our staff do that that is because we take a person-centered approach. One more slide, I promise. I know I promised you only one, but I had two. Um, from a systems perspective, this has resulted in a reduction in the chances of reinvestigation um, pretty significantly. So for self-neglect cases, um, those who entered our program versus those who were served by APS but were not in our program, 10% um, reduction, um, 10 times more, 10 times less likely to enter the system. For caregiver neglect, nine times um, less likely to, to be reinvestigated. And you can see the numbers on, on the slide. So what we've seen is that the clients that we work with are less likely to enter the system, um, back into the system, be re-referred. And I think part of that, um, I think a large part of that is due to the, 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 the self, um, the client-centered approach we work and being able to really engage clients in, in their own goals, which keeps them motivated um, and moving forward in, in improving their own lives. Um, I will stop there and pass the mic over to Margaret. Thank you very much. Here are um, a couple of links if you want to check us out. And uh, and Margaret, I hand it over virtually to you. Thank you. I'm Margaret Carson. I'm the program manager of the Muckleshoot Tribes Adult Protective Services. I've worked in adult protective services for over 30 years. Um, we're located in near the Seattle area, south of Seattle, near Mount Rainier. Next slide. Next slide. The I assisted in um, implementing the Elder and Vulnerable Adult Code that was passed by the Tribal Council and established in May of 2011, there were a small tribe. We have 3,162 enrolled tribal members, 488 elders over 50 years of age. We, we define an elder over 50. And we have a very robust adult protective services program in that we have between 350 and 400 APS referrals a year since 2016. Next slide. 
we operate with a restorative justice model. And what that means is that we strive to serve the community and provide healing for all those involved, not just the elder, but their families as well, and to come up with system-oriented uh, solutions rather than uh, something that would be traditionally in the criminal justice system. We provide investigation, we provide protective services, but our protective services are different than the state model. I did work with the state of Washington before I did the tribal APS, and I found that the state model didn't work as well because of the cultural differences. The, um, the tribal code uh, establishes elder protection team meetings, which we do have. Uh, the model is similar to a Native American circle approach, but a little bit different in that uh, rather than having a talking piece, we, we provide that everyone takes turns talking, but we don't use the traditional talking piece, but we do have everyone involved participate. The, we involve the members of the community at the elders request. So if we're going to have an elder protection team meeting, what we would do is we would ask the elder or their surrogate decision maker, if they have lack capacity, their uh, guardian or, or their uh, the, the family trusted member the, that's been put in charge. And we would ask them who they would want to be involved in the team meeting. So rather than having a, an empty and um, a, a team that's established that the same people come every time, we would establish a different team depending on the elders' preferences. So we might ask, who is the person that you uh, feel some resonance with that works over at Muckleshoot Health and Wellness? And we would get that provider. We would have the person that's trusted from behavioral health. We would get a program manager or staff that's involved with the elders complex, someone from housing, the prosecutor that, that, that they really liked. So the team that would be uh, uh, the, the team that would be the, the elder protection team would not would might look different for one client than another, depending on their comfort level. We would also involve family members, we'd involve tribal council members. It would be different depending on the situation of the, of the particular elder. But that we would involve the elder because that would be, it would be culturally, it would be um, inappropriate for us not to include the elder or their surrogate decision maker in these team meetings. And the way that it's set up is that we start the meeting and we there's three different uh, aspects. The first is that everyone expresses what their concerns are. So um, we would list all the concerns, what the elder would be, that health issues, whatever would come up and everyone would, everyone in the meeting would um, go around the circle approach and write the concerns. We would um, note those on a, on, on a, on a board or on a, on a tablet. And then everyone in, 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 a, in a brainstorming session would come up with ideas to address what the concerns were and everyone would participate in that. But the third aspect is that there would be a plan and that the only one that can establish what the plan would be, the person that makes the decision about what the outcome would be, would be the elder or their surrogate decision maker. So there might be a meeting where someone there might think that we should um, kick everybody out of the home and have the sister move in and the elder would want something completely different. We would go along with what the elder would want. And then we would take the, uh, the decision and we would run it, run it by the elders, the elders committee or the law and order committee to make sure that it's a safe plan before we would implement it. And the, rather than having just one meeting, we might have a number of meetings to establish a plan and come up with something that was community-based rather than it being something that where the committee would decide something, the elder decides, and then we would support that plan along with the community uh, supports. It's similar to a, um, a family team decision-making process rather than it being something it's more of an organic process. And some of the things that we would come up with for solutions 
would be um, protection orders, restitution. We are allowed to do restitution with our tribal code and attach the per capita payments. Uh, this is also very effective. It shows that crime doesn't pay. We could get, get the money back from someone. For instance, someone took a flat screen uh, television set and they sold it to a drug dealer for $100. Well, they'd have to pay back the, uh, the, the, the fair market value of that. So it, it, would, it, it wouldn't uh, really benefit the person who took it. And the protection orders, we offer lots and lots of protection orders. The reason we do so many protection orders, it's a way of setting a boundary or a limit on what's acceptable in the community. And we would take the protection order off if the person, for instance, went through treatment and then improved. It wouldn't be that we would keep the protection order on as um, a matter of punishment, but it would be a matter that that it would be in, unacceptable for someone in the community or family member to treat an elder in that way. And the tribe would step in and say, this is inappropriate, you need to, to get some assistance. And if they got the assistance, then we would draw the court order at that time. We also have some specific things that just come out of these uh, tribal meetings that including ban lists. We have a list of people that are banned that we might put on someone's door. This is something that the elders came up with. We have house rules and interventions. So we might develop the house rules in the elder protection team meetings and then go to the home and post them. We found that found that not only do we post them, but I've needed to get a laminator because sometimes the the people at the home won't like them. They'll they'll take the uh, uh, the house rules. And so we will we'll laminate them and put them on the on the on the refrigerator. We'll go there and read them. We'll we'll we do some inter we do some interventions in the home. We also offer payees. Um, the guardianships are usually outside of the uh, elder protection team meetings. Those would be established before we would bring it in to the team meeting. We focus in on treatment and collaboration um, and that the services are within the tribe and the community if possible. We have our own Muckleshoot Health and Wellness Center, our own health care. We have our own housing we have our own behavioral health. We have a number of services here. We have our own 24-hour elders program that provides in-home services. So we have some really good resources here, and we're able to use the resources here to help our elders and vulnerable adults. And I was going to give a case example of one that was, uh, uh, there was a, uh, an elder, and he came to me, and he said that he had had all these family members moving in with him. And the children were, there were a lot of his heritage, personal property, including his drums and his fishing equipment were being taken out of the home and they were being sold for money for drugs. And he wanted me to come into the home and basically get everybody to improve. And that's what the elders usually want. They want the, this, this is the reason for the restorative justice model is they don't, he didn't want me to, to file police reports and put them in jail. He wanted me to go to the home and get them to, and to improve, to, to work and, or to get, uh, go to treatment, to, to live a quality life. And so I told him, well, this is a lot for me to take on. Let's follow our process, our elder protection team process. So he identified people that he felt comfortable with, including tribal council members, family members, people from different departments and divisions, the in-home program, Muggleshoot Health and Wellness. And we had a, we had a nice team meeting. And um, in the team meeting, there were lots of ideas but what he decided he wanted to do is he wanted to do an intervention and he wanted us to go to the home, a group of us, and to have everybody to go with behavioral health, to set house rules and to make everyone in the, all of the family members to, to let them know that they either needed to be in school or they needed to have a job or they needed to be doing something productive with their lives. And if not, then we would go and get, get court orders. So we did this and uh, 
I went to the home and like a town crier, I stood and read the, the house rules in the middle of the living room. There were about 15 of us there. The police came with us, but they stayed outside. And it was really important, not only that we did this, but who was all involved. There were family members that were elders that were well-respected in the community. Tribal council was there, department heads. It was an intervention. They knew that we meant business. And so behavioral health was there with their consent forms. It was all very organized. They knocked on the doors and all of the family members came out. I read the house rules and then we had them sign the, the consent forms. And it turns out that they complied and that um, a couple of them moved out. Most of them, of them, not only were they bringing in, not only were their family members there, but they were bringing their, their friends in. There was all the thieving going on. So part of the house rules was that doors and windows are all locked at 10 o'clock at night. No drugs and alcohol are allowed in the home. No thieving will be allowed. And um, the family members will help with chores as assigned and just establish some house rules. And it actually, it worked. And it turns out that we didn't have to get any protection orders on this case, that everyone complied, and that the elder was able to remain in his home for the rest of his life with in-home services. And we were able to get some of the, of the personal heritage property back by going on Facebook or, or tracking it down, just asking for them. There weren't any charges that were filed, but that everyone did comply with our orders and it was a very successful outcome. The elder was incredibly happy with the outcome. And when we went there and did the intervention, intervention he was smiling. So part of, of the lesson is that we involved the elder. This was a competent elder, capable of making his own decisions. But it was something that was his, it was his meeting. And so there was buy-in from him. So the intervention worked beautifully well. So that was, anyway, I, I will, I'll finish it off and I will hand it over to Madge, Madge Haynes. Thank you. Uh, wonderful to hear your experiences with applying person-centered approaches in your work. What are one or two words that come to mind for you? Um, again, the idea is to click on the Mentimeter link that's provided in chat and then um, submit your responses. So we'll, Wait for folks to start engaging in that. Again, it's one or what are one or two words that come to mind, having heard what we've seen. Client driven, yes, inspiring. Collaboration, cultural competence, respect, dignity, forward thinking really like that word. Um, Self-determination. Competence, I see. Helpful, insightful, awareness that keep coming, wonderful, keep adding. We've got collaboration. Um, listening to the individual. Hearing the voice. Prioritize, uh-huh. I see res restorative justice is also mentioned in this one. Family involvement, um, client focused. Respect seems to be the, the most um, most mentioned. The larger the word, the more it's, where it's being provided by folks. So that's definitely hitting home in terms of the respect involved in the value of this approach. Hopeful. Good word, good word, hopeful, caring, inspiring, and healing. I see healing, social justice, um, wonderful reactions, you all. Love to hear this. Time consuming, I see that. And at, 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 at the same time, I see hope um, right underneath the time consuming. Um, so it sounds like it could be, but it sounds like there's a whole lot of benefit uh, from the time that's invested, at least from the speakers we've heard of from so far. Okay, these are awesome reactions. And um, there's definitely some energy and curiosity that's been sparked among the group from 
the speakers that we've heard from. Um, we're not done yet in terms of hearing from speakers. And yes, please continue to add your words here so we can continue to build on the word cloud as I speak. Lines, draft guidelines, suggested guidelines, however you want to interpret them, that we came up with as a result of that initial consensus convening and uh, and uh, and questionnaire that that we sent out, and they we f hope that you'll find them helpful. They'll be easily available to you following following this webinar. But these are principles to keep in mind as we go along. Understanding what the client's wishes are um, through their own eyes, through their own eyes, and making sure it's culturally responsive. What works for one group may or may not work for the other. Um, uh, considering different sorts of, of, of approaches that may not be traditional, um, asking kind of what's important to you instead of what can we do for you? As, as I think Patty mentioned, we're all healers and we want to, you know, we're trying to fix things. And sometimes the question isn't, what do I need to do? But what does this situation need me to do? And what does this person in this situation need me to do? Um, what kind of structures do we need to develop to facilitate facilitate client identified goals? How do we leverage um, our local um, uh, community based organizations, uh, networks, et cetera, in order to make this work? And how do we manage our own risk tolerance and let's face it, legal risk tolerance for choices that might really expose somebody to a very harmful situation? These are guidelines that we hope will be useful to you and that we'd like for you to keep in mind as we move into our panel presentation. As we do, and I'll ask all the panelists to unmask themselves at this point, scene. And so, Zach, what are you seeing as some strategies that different groups have used that really meaningfully integrate clients' preferences and values into MDT discussions and, and the decision-making progress uh, process? Yeah, thanks for that, Dr. Mosqueda. So um, there are several approaches that um, I've seen used in practice. Uh, they pop up here and there. I, I wouldn't say there's necessarily a consistent approach that I've seen used pretty universally, which is why something like today's symposium, I think it's so valuable. Um, early on in our work, we looked at the forensic centers that got started in California in the mid 2000s. Uh, one of them was based down in San Diego. They had a, a team that was that kind of built on an existing coordinated community response team or CCR team, which is used in DV and IPV and sexual assault. And as that part of that team, they actually used the approach of bringing in the older adult, the alleged victim into the conversation uh, and actually having them attend the meetings. Uh, I know that that approach is uh, also followed by other, uh, other organizations around the country. Uh, we heard from them that that could be a really valuable way to get the voice of the individual uh, at the table. But of course, it, uh, we also heard that it did sometimes inhibit conversation between the professionals uh, and made it difficult to sometimes speak freely about some sensitive topics with the person in the room. Some other approaches are to have an individual at the table, an individual part of the meeting, who essentially acts as uh, a conduit for the voice of the older adult, uh, a voice of the alleged victim. Uh, we saw one example of that here in Los Angeles, where we tried to incorporate a novel position called the service advocate into the team. This was a dedicated individual who would meet with the, uh, the alleged victim, hopefully before the meeting, and really work to, uh, through asking a series of questions, doing some interviewing, work to really uh, find out as much as possible about that person, their preferences and their desires. So they could really bring that into the meeting um, and also oftentimes would represent the case and come back to the team with updates so they could uh, hear updates about what was going on and how closely that aligned with the preferences and desires of the alleged victim. So that was a nice a smorgasbord there that you uh, that you provided for us. But let me ask um, all of our panelists, like, this all sounds great. You know, you, you've you seen a few different ways that things work. I've heard a lot of terms here. I've heard restorative justice and motivational interviewing uh, and trauma-informed care and supported decision-making. And it can feel a little 
overwhelming, um, quite frankly. So I'm just wondering, and maybe Tara, you can start us off, but then we'll get the whole group going. Is it realistic to incorporate some of these things into an MDT, like from the from the legal perspective? Um, uh, so can you talk a little bit about that and then we'll hear other perspectives as well? Sure, thank you. Um, you know, it, it absolutely is realistic. And I think, um, and the point was made earlier, if, if and I really liked the, the word that, that Patty Kimball brought up with just us approaching this work with humility. Um, and I think for everyone, that's just such an important guiding force. And if we, as a, an MDT, as we have in, in my own MDT in St. Paul, um, really staying focused on the on, on what we're trying to do and what our overall goal is. Um, and I think you have to have you have to have a, a structure that that creates that. Um, so you have to have a whether it's your mission statement of your MDT or your uh, just your bylaws, however you operate, um, make sure that you are including that goal. Um, right front and center and that you have and who in your who in your group is responsible for seeking victim input for example and I I say victim um, in the prosecution world we say victim when a case is pending um, I know many of you use the terms survivors and patients and clients um, but uh, I think in, in addition to making sure that we're staying focused on what the 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 subject matter, the older adult is, is wanting, um, also being just educated on, on what that means and being educated on the religions and cultures and the different communities that make up your jurisdiction um, so that you're able to, so you're, when you're having discussions about cases, someone's asking the group, all right, does, does the fact that this person is, for example, we have a large Hmong population in in St. Paul. And so sometimes for some older adults, that's that's really an important driving force that may be a part of decision making. Um, so understanding, uh, educating everyone in the group on what those norms are and how we respond to those. Um, so I'm getting a little afield perhaps from your original question, but I, I think it absolutely is feasible if everyone has the will and education to do that. I think what uh, uh, part of what you're saying here th makes me think about the culture of an MDT. Um, and so um, maybe some of our other panelists can talk about how do you shape culture of, of an MDT? It feels a little bit like herding cats. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, I was struck by the presentations, the amazing presentations from Patty and Margaret about the in-depth processes that are in place in, uh, within their organizations and how much time, effort, and energy it really takes to, to do it right and to do it well and to really ensure that the voice of the client, victim, what have you, is incorporated. Um, I, I think that within MDTs, it's it's even more important than in other aspects of the elder justice response system because the MDT doesn't always have the client there in front of them. I think when you're working with a client and you have the client face-to-face -face with you, it's it's harder to ignore that person as an individual. Whereas when you're sitting all around a table, similar to Patty's figure that we saw, it can be much easier to almost dehumanize the individual um, and to really just talk about them and talk about these uh, resources, services, et cetera, for them. Um, I think within the elder justice field as a whole, over my 20 years in the field at least, I've seen a shift uh, away from more of the paternalistic approaches and more towards the person-centered approaches um, and seeing now with this project and others, the incorporation of them into MDTs, I think is really wonderful, very timely. Making that culture change can be challenging, but we are we have the benefit of this being part of a groundswell, I think, of movement towards the person-centered approaches into elder justice practice. So hopefully we can pick back on with some of the existing initiatives. I would also suggest that it's not an all or nothing proposition, um, that any way you can begin to shift your work toward a more person-centered approach is, 
it, it, it will have a ripple effect. So I, I do hear the sort of over, there's a, I do hear the sort of overwhelming, potentially overwhelming feeling about doing it right and doing it right and making sure you're, um, you're understanding it. And I, I think if we demystify what it is, it really, at the core, it's really the way all of us would want to be, all of us want to be treated when we're receiving a service or um, some care. We, um, there was, there was a, What's it called? What's it called when you draw a little thing? Cartoon? Not a, not a cartoon that I meant to include, but it somehow got deleted. Where there's a patient in a bed, and there's a doctor that's looking at a computer, looking away from the client, uh, the patient, and there's a doctor that's looking at a at a at a file, right? And the patient's laying there in bed without anybody looking at them. And so I think at its core, it's very basic. Um, we we can certainly do. We can always do it better, but. But I don't think you have to do it all to do to to, to begin to employ those practices. And I, I really like Terry your approach about maybe it's part of the mission statement. Maybe it's sort of checking in. Is this a person centered approach? Is are we really thinking about the client? Are we beginning to use language that others them? Are we speaking to uh, to to your point, Zach? Are we using their name when we're talking about the person? Um, are we are we grounding ourselves in their reality? Um, and not necessarily always about the practices we use to, on a person, right? So the circle is not always appropriate, but the practices we use ourselves um, when we're speaking about people, even that has um, the potential for making um, change in culture. I one of the things, just quickly, one of the things we do that I, I, I recognize might be awkward and cumbersome maybe, maybe not, is using, trying in, even in case notes, in referral forms, in any documentation we write down or about our clients, we use a strength-based approach. So we always ask people, think about strengths in addition to the challenges. And so even if we begin to think of people as not a list of problems, not a list of complications, not a list of services needed, but as human beings with strengths and challenges, I think that shift get, moves us in a person-centered direction. I agree. Um, one of the things that I think can get in the way is this fear of, well, for example, having the, and, and our MDT has never had the uh, the older adult themselves in the MDT meeting. Um, I'm really fascinated with that idea. I really um, am interested in learning more about that and, and kind of thinking about how we could incorporate something like that. Um, I can see people thinking, well, uh, for example, prosecutors have to be considerate of the fact that, you know, are we going to get information through this MDT or through this person participating in the MDT um, that is going to compromise our, our prosecution that we're going to have to turn over to the defense, which will then, of course, perhaps create safety issues uh, for, for the victim. Um, so I think part of your your initial work as an MDT is is educating each other on what your barriers are, educating each other on what your um, data practices, rules, and your discovery obligations, all of those things, so that so that they don't necessarily it's sort of this fear of the unknown. Um, is it's not the unknown anymore. You understand what the barriers are. Um, there could be a situation where we would. I could see have a an older adult participating in MDT in the MDT meeting that's about their life, um, and I would step out of that meeting for if if we had a pending case, for example. Um, so I think there's ways that you can work around that um, and still accomplish the ultimate goal, which is is really trying to uh, make the person whole, um, make sure ensure their safety. Uh, I, I even as a prosecutor over the the last number of years and kind of being involved in this work, uh, perpetrator accountability actually is secondary to victim safety and autonomy and feeling like we're really leaving that person in a better position than we were when we entered their lives. Yeah, I think there's always that conundrum of safety versus autonomy and who gets to decide? Who gets to decide uh, what wins under what circumstances, and how how our own um, backgrounds and biases contribute contribute to that is really important to be aware of. Um, we've got some great questions coming in. Um, so, panelists, I'm warning you, I'm not going off of 
questions that we talked about. We're going live with uh, with our wonderful um, audience. So one thing that's come up a few times, I, I told you this wasn't going to be easy, is the idea of like undue influence so that um, it all sounds good that you want to go along with what this older adult wants. But what if there's true undue influence? There may not be any dementia at all, but they may now have a variety of emotional vulnerabilities that have led led them to really be under the spell of somebody who doesn't have what we think is their best interest in mind. How do you do person-centered approaches in that in that sort of a circumstance? Can or can you? I'll I'll start with that. I, th I think you absolutely can. Um, Law enforcement investigates uh, a whole host of things related to our cases, and that's a thing that they can investigate as well. So I do think that that's something that we have to consider when we're, um, can we take a uh, the older adult's wishes and input at face value? That's a thing that we're always asking about in, in my office when we're uh, prosecuting these cases. Are we able to take their input at face value, um, or are there... Uh, outside forces, undue influence, manipulation, straight up intimidation. Um, so we often are, are working with others who are doing investigating in the case. It might be our APS partners, our law enforcement partners to try to find out, do some investigating and find out if that's something that's going on. Another thing that we do at the beginning of our prosecutions often is giving victims information about what you might expect to hear from the perpetrator while this case is pending. Um, kind of just some of the, based on our experience on some of the things that the perpetrator will say, that this is all your fault and I'm gonna to go to prison for a really long time, those kinds of things. So we can uh, hear those from victims, let them know we wanna hear about those things and try to counter some of those messages um, and really engage with that person. I think the important thing is for all of us, regardless of what lane we're in, um, engaging and hearing from victims or older adults. And I have something um, to add. I find that in our um, in our elder team uh, meetings, that when there is someone, I can think of a, no of, of a number of different examples when there's uh, have been like a family member that's living there that's taking advantage, we think that they're influence, influencing the elder by taking money. Typically, what the team will do is that the team will confront this. And what the concerns will be will be exactly this is this is what the concerns are. And it's a way with the team will um, basically confront that issue and then come up with a solution. And so the, the elder might say, you know, you're right, they've been taking advantage of me, and they'll actually will make the decision to do something about it. So that the team meetings, by having the other family members there that will provide the information, that can move things along often. I, I think, too, the... the um addressing the fear that an individual may have in acknowledging something is happening um, and what they lose might lose um, by admitting that. So um, the loss of a relationship that's really important to somebody, um, despite what we see as harmful, is more detrimental to the person in their eyes than the harm that is being caused by that person. Um, and I think two things about that. One, we need to understand that, right? We need to acknowledge that those relationships are important as told to us by the client. And in order for the client to be able to share that, they have to have somebody they trust, right? And so if they do fear the consequences of acknowledging something is happening, where can they go? Who is, who is the person they can speak to? Where has that relationship been built that they can say, um, I know the rest of the system thinks this is wrong, but I, I want a relationship with a person that's harming me. Um, so I think it's establishing some, it doesn't have to be everyone, but somebody somewhere that the person um, feels okay about admitting what's re what they really want, even if the system is not um, uh, in favor of it. And I think it's so important, as you say, asking 
you know, a victim or a person may be telling us that they want a certain thing. That doesn't necessarily mean, for example, they want to stay in their home. That doesn't mean that they want all the risk associated with that. So understanding, as you say, um, the why, and also having being open with the uh, with the older adult about what our goals are. Um, but I may, if I sit down with an older adult in a case that we have, um, maybe I would say, you know, here's I'm I'm concerned about your safety, um, and here are, and my goal is to 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 not separate you from your family, but to figure out a way that you can have that well and also be safe. Um, and then kind of go from there. And, and if you have, if through your MDT, you have the, uh, everyone is educated on the various resources that may be able to come in and assist that older adult in some of the things that they think that they're going to lose by this person being out of their life for a period of time. Um, sometimes that can be helpful as well. But I think, you know, again, at the end of the day, if we're, if we're all, everyone on the team through their various uh, areas of expertise um, are are knowledgeable of all of the different ways that we can assist the person in ways that they may not recognize are available to them. Um, it's not just giving someone a you know a resources. Uh, here's a list of resources. Go out and see. <laughs> this, hopefully, this will be helpful to you. Um, there are a lot of really uh, uh, gifted and caring people on our MBT who are able to do that. And again, keeping that person's goals front and center. We just have to continually remind each other on the on the in the group what does that person want or do we know what they want through other bridge people that we can trust have their their best interests at, at heart. I, I've heard the word risk a few times and I don't know if any of anybody here is willing to risk an answer to this one, but it can't all be great. I mean, this all sounds like great kumbaya and, you know, this is what we want to do. And, and it, it it is, you know, I think what we aspire to. But have you ever seen any bad outcomes um, through, through a person-centered approach? Have you ever, like, really thought twice um, about what you did? Um, and by by allowing the risk, by respecting the autonomy, et cetera. This is Margaret. I have seen that the elder being um, being confronted with what the situation was will get mad about the the confrontation. And what that means is that that even though that the people there have brought up what the concerns were. They might not like the fact that they're being confronted. And if we had one elder, it was a, a one where I wasn't facilitating it because I was in a different meeting. I came in, the elder had just walked out. And the uh, the idea was is that the elder didn't like the fact that the family members were being really confrontive. And often what will happen is that sometimes the family, uh, the elder protection team meetings, it's a less restrictive to doing something more like a nuisance abatement or other some other, other um, non-collaborative approaches, but we try it first. And we, we, we see whether it, that has the opportunity to work. The elder in this case, um, because I wasn't there, she apologized, and we we could have another meeting, and we did work something out. But sometimes the the elders or the vulnerable adults, they will want to have this person in their life, even if it's not a good idea. It affects their their health and safety, and sometimes there just isn't a lot we can do to to go around that, except to to offer the less restrictive services. And if they won't accept it and it becomes like a safety issue, then, then it has to be dealt with differently. So if I can uh, take a minute to think through, um, talk aloud or think aloud about some of the risks that uh, might be present at the kind of more macro level. One of the things that 
pursuing person-centered goals and approaches might introduce could be some tension between team members, um, especially if you have some team members who come from very person-centered orientations and disciplines, whereas others have more of the paternalistic, protective uh, mindset and framework in mind. Uh, I think this is particularly salient when you have newer teams, newer MDTs, where they haven't been working as closely uh, for as long, uh, haven't established as cohesive bonds among team members. Uh, it could be that there are new members of the team or just there haven't been a uh, there hasn't been enough time put into establishing the, the mutual culture amongst the team members. Or for some teams, especially in larger areas, uh, they'll get a different person from individual agencies coming to the meetings, every different uh, team meeting. So trying to establish a culture, trying to get everyone on, on board and oriented in the same direction with regards to pursuing person-centered approaches could be quite tricky. And if, if everyone's not on the same page, it could result in uh, contention between team members. It could result in people who just aren't engaging in the case as much as they might otherwise be. And frankly, those types of dynamics can lead to worse client outcomes as well. Yeah, I certainly have observed that. Um, and, um, and I just think it's a real thing that we all need to talk about. Um, and one thing, that comes up for me then is how much of a barrier is that to person-centered care or how much of it is something that we kind of acknowledge and see and then start to chip away at. Sometimes we talk about ripple effects of things going out. Um, there's also, I don't know what to call it other than a reverse ripple effect, which is there's people who I think in the middle who are super person-centered or MDTs, and then there's kind of rings in and one thing I think about for our MBT is just how we can we get a little bit better, uh, just a little bit better at a time. Um, you know, I think there's some important questions coming up. Um, again, very real life stuff through the chat and through the Q&A function of it's great to respect autonomy. But if I'm, for example, an APS worker or, you know, you know working for an agency where my job is to try to protect this person's safety. And now you all are telling me, well, you know, that's nice, but that's not what they wanna do. So not so much. And by the way, you need to spend a lot more time also that you may not have figuring out what it is they want. This can put a lot, but I think particularly on adult protective services who often are the, you know, getting conflicting messages from the government, from agencies, from bosses, from MDT members, from, from the older adult or the person with disability, you know, how does somebody navigate through, through all that? Do you have one or two hints on, on, uh, on approaches or thoughts on how to make it a little bit better and easier? I, I would reiterate your point uh, in terms of the, the prosecution point or side of things as well. I mean, we have, we are also having to balance not just the, uh, you know, victim autonomy and safety, but also community safety. I mean, we have an obligation to prosecute people who steal money from older adults, for example. And so if, and I can recall a case that um, I had a number of years ago that we didn't charge, that we really had pretty good evidence on that was a very large scale financial exploitation um, of someone who had a significant amount of money. And in, in the end, um, I didn't charge the case. Um, well, we didn't charge the case. It was a very, um, very much a group effort on our MDT law enforcement and everybody really thinking through what would be the in the best interests of this person and what they wanted, honoring that person's wishes. But we had the public to answer to because this was somebody who was well known in the in the in the public. Um, people knew about that what had happened, and it was really a hard thing to navigate. Um, and we had to, we just really had to think about um, taking sort of taking those hard bumps. <laughs> um, doing what we could to uh, 
to ensure that the, the perpetrator wasn't someone that was going to go out and do this to someone else, which we never know, right? Um, again, it's it's a tough call. I still wonder, did that person go out and, and ended up you know, victimizing someone else? Um, it was a really hard call, and I don't have an answer other than to acknowledge that I think everyone in their different disciplines uh, grapples with this, but I'm, I'm, I think it's just really valuable that we're having the discussion and, and shifting the focus. Um, I would, I would respond to that question in two ways. One is I might push back a little bit that, um, that APS doesn't do that, that, that it is difficult for APS to do person-centered work. I'm not saying it is not difficult. I'm saying for my experience, when I look out into the broader community, um, APS is is more often respecting client choice and autonomy than some of the other partner agencies we work with. Um, so I actually feel like we're allies in person-centered work. It might look a little different, right? Um, because APS has certain statutes and, and legislative responsibilities, right? And we have others. It may look different, but actually the core to me, um, the core of, of APS's work is to is is self-determination. So yes, there are circumstances, there are times when they cannot ab abide by all of the client's wishes, but that is true for all of us, right? So um I would just sort of spin that a little bit differently, that actually sometimes we are allied to try to speak on behalf of a client with other agencies that may not have that perspective. Um, the other thing is, I, I think there are ways, and I, I know this sounds like like a big, um, I think I'm gonna stop myself from, from, there are very specific practices, very small practices I think we can employ in any agency, whether we're able to do it, you know, like I uh, where perfectly, or just tweak a few things that are more person-centered. I think it's unrealistic to expect that a prosecutor, that everybody at a, at the table is going to be able to do person-centered work in, in, a, in a pure way. And I don't think there is purity in this approach. Um, I think what, what Tara said, and I would echo this, is really understanding what each person's role, what each, I don't think we ask those questions. Like Zach, as a researcher, what is valuable to you, right? What What are the, and Zach and I have this, when we, we think about projects, how do you ask, how would, what information do you want, Zach, as a researcher from our client population? Zach may ask that question from a researcher's perspective. I may get mad because I think that is not a person-centered way to ask that question. And Zach is like, well, then tell me, Patty, how would clients hear that question? Um, sorry, Zach, to call you out. Um, but I think it's really understanding, like, I don't, I'm not a researcher. I don't know, I don't know what Zach does and how Zach does it until I understand that. I don't, I'm, I'm going to assume that um, he's not working in a person-centered way when that's not that we're speaking different languages. So I just want to underscore what Tara said, that that breaking down the barriers and the humility among team members is really important. And like, don't be embarrassed that you don't know exactly what prosecutors can or can't do that or what law enforcement can or can't do, that you don't understand the processes of very complicated systems. Um, trying to understand that, I think then we can employ, again, very subtle strategies into our practices that will change the structure that we've set up. I hope that I hope that made sense. I agree with you, Patty, and and I I was saying that I think often APS the advocate community are very victim centered, older adult centered, client centered, um, and it's been an education for me, and I think for many prosecutors and law enforcement for pe people who come from sort of that side of things to participate in an MDT to just really learn how to have that focus. So um, I think that's, yeah, I think that's really important. All right, so I'm gonna be again, the skunk at the picnic here with all this and, and saying it sounds great, but um, I do think there's potential harms here. Um, and I think there's a couple that have come up through our Q and A. One is, what if somebody has a dementia? Now. Let's just put on the table, there's different degrees of dementia in early and middle and late stages and, and, and all that. So we don't want to make too many blanket statements. But if somebody has you know, significantly impaired capacity, to take an extreme example, we're not so person-centered that somebody with Alzheimer's who wants to walk on the freeway will say, go ahead, because you know 
that's what you want, right? So that's sort of a silly extreme example, but these are the kinds of things that I think come up in, in abuse sort of situations. Um, and the idea also getting to Tara's point is when do you hold people accountable for, for, uh, for bad things as well, even if the older adult doesn't want the person who's being victimized, um, abused, doesn't want us to. Um, and so to talk to us a little bit, I'm, again, I'm, I'm going to push back on your pushback and say, this sounds good, but it's hard to do. And I'm thinking that there's times when you have to draw a line as well and say, we really got to do something here, even if it's not congruent with, with what this particular person wants. What, when, when might that occur? Or does it really just never occur for you? Um, from, from my point of view and how we handle things here tribally, if somebody, if there's a competent, capacitated adult without a dementia process, then our process that we have them make the decisions, it's their decision. And as long as it's safe, we run it by the elders committee, we run it by the um, law and order committee to make sure that it's a good plan. However, if someone lacks the capacity to make their own decisions, if they have a dementia process, we would not have them directly involved in one of our elder protection team meetings in the same role. We would, like there was one case where we had uh, part of our, our, our process, we had to activate uh, a, a, a DPOA document. And then we had the surrogate decision maker and they were the ones that were stepped in and the in the elder of the client's behalf, and they were the ones that participated in the in our uh, in our elder protection team meeting in behalf of the client. If somebody has intermittent capacity or it's not real clear, sometimes it's not appropriate for the elder to be there if they have a dementia process and they don't understand the consequences. So we typically have someone there in their behalf. And then what we do is that, that this person's role is to communicate with the elder. We involve them in the ways that they can be involved with, but we're really sensitive to the capacity issue. The When the elder makes the decision, it's like they're capacitated, they can make their own decisions, they're cognitively bright. But if there's capacity issues, we would um, we would not have them in the same role. We would have a surrogate that would step in that would be the part of the of the process because part of what we need to do, the restorative justice piece, is that we're creating safety in the community. And if we're having a somebody with a dementia process that's wandering and and you know they want to continue doing this, part of that's part of the problem. And so we would need to have the family member there with what are the ways we can work with this person in a, in a client-centered way? Could we provide in-home services so that the team would be there to problem solve, but the elder would not necessarily be involved in the, the meeting because it just wouldn't make sense. So if if you have somebody who does have capacity and you think they're making a very unsafe decision, like very unsafe, um, where would you go with that? Well, we would take it to the, uh, as I said, the, the ideas have to pass the elders committee and the law and order committee, and it just wouldn't go anywhere. We would have to tell them that this is something that they'd have to rethink it. I think one thing in being an adult protective services state and then tribal is the person has the right, the capacity, as long as they have the capacity to make their own decisions, they have the ability to make poor decisions for themselves. But if they would decide that, there would be other things that could do. For instance, if they were creating a, um, a health and safety issue in the, com in the community, it might be referred to another committee for a nuisance abatement, or there could be other processes that would step in. So our checks and balances in this is that we have committees where we have to get the, the ideas approved. And it's gotta be a common sense thing, like the idea of doing a, an intervention uh, with 
um, a competent adult, we think that that would be fine. Some of the other things would be okay, but some, but some other ideas like having a, um, like as I said, like uh, somebody with a, a dementia process and cutting their in-home care when they could wander into the street and get hurt, we just wouldn't go for that. We would have to, we would put a family member in charge and we would have them at the meeting instead. And if somebody made a poor decision like that they were, uh, they decided that they wanted to have their children that, that were there that were dealing drugs. Well, that would be a health and safety issue and that they may, they'd have to face the consequences of that. That would be their right we would go the less restrictive and try to help them and say, if you don't accept this help um, our, with our process, it might get referred on to something a little bit less client-centered. And so that's how we handle it here. But, Patty, what, what do you do when you have somebody who, who truly lacks capacity to make reasonable decisions? Um, so... Uh, truly lacks capacity means that there's been a diagnosis. There's been right. Are we suggesting they have they have advanced Alzheimer's disease? There, uh, they have hallucinations and delusions, um, and um, and uh, have very almost no memory, uh, other than very long term memories. They've been diagnosed appropriately um yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so um and the reason i say that laura not to be provocative in this setting but sometimes when we hear that somebody has cognitive decline and we ask about the source of cognitive decline it's a family member who who may benefit from suggesting that a person has cognitive decline right so and quite frankly in our world having a having a it validated is not as easy it's not that easy right so I, I do we do ask how is this something you're beginning to see is this something family members are seeing is it is there a physician involved before we um before we as we think about capacity but in the case you're describing um Supported decision making is the approach that we use, which sounds very similar to what Margaret is describing. That there, um, hopefully, there are people in in the older person's life who know what the client would want, who can help advocate on behalf of the client. So, um, just like Margaret, we would not we would not advocate for uh, risk behave risky behavior um, with somebody who's who's got severe Alzheimer's and is is um, is incapacitated and can't make those decisions. Um, it's the, the problem I think is it the, the problem is sort of systemic too, right? Because who are the people and this is where I think the MDTs are incredibly valuable um, because you go because going to a team to say how do we understand the parameters of what our system, like you're representing a system on an MDT. So you see the roles people can play in helping with those approaches. So, um, you know, our agency works with formal and informal supporters, with supported decision-making, with alternative um, uh, collateral contacts with people that um, in the community that know the client and for whom the client would um, would have them speak on, on their behalf. But if you're in an agency where that's not the case, how do, how do we work together to make sure that's happening, right? So I, I think that's the, the MDT really provides an opportunity to go to the, the source, of the, to, to go to a mini system and say, how do we deal with this issue? But I want to underscore, we, like Margaret, would not promote um, uh, behaviors for somebody who's unable to make decisions for themselves that are that put them in harm. And, and I just want to bring that up because I think that, that tends to be where our head goes very often. Um, and what I'm hearing from all of you is the reality is, yes, that does happen, but maybe maybe we're a little too concerned about that, that, that actually there's a lot more times when we could be person-centered without increasing risk than maybe we realize. Am I hearing that correctly? 
Um, I would say so. I would say so, Laura. And I also go back to my original point that I think investigating the the diagnosis of dementia or the diagnosis of of lacking capacity is really important. I'm I'm going to bring up the A word, which is ageism. I I think we we start to assume um, lack of capacity as people get older more often than we would consume lack of assume lack of capacity for younger people. So really questioning ourselves when we're suggesting that that is a reason somebody we shouldn't be listening to somebody's choices um, and sort of unpacking our own assumptions about aging and 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 related cognitive decline. I'm so glad you brought that up um, because it's something that we run into a lot. And of course, uh, my definition of capacity, uh, the way I need to think about it for a criminal prosecution um, and a victim's uh, ability to participate in that is very different from someone's capacity to maybe make decisions on where they want to live or what they want to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's um, that's important. But also investigating, if someone is presenting with some cognitive impairment, investigating uh, because of ageism, many of us just assume that that person, if they are if they're advanced age, that they're experiencing dementia. But um, trauma can also be the source of someone presenting with cognitive decline, um, depression, medications. There's a UTI, of course. There's there's so many different things that can affect cognition, and so uh, if if we're just being careful to know, as you say, what the source is. Um, sometimes it can be temporary. I mean, of course, it's, it's dementia that's that's progressive and it's not going to change, um, but it, it may be temporary. And then it, once that is addressed in some way, it's not that easy, of course, but um, we may be then able to get valuable information for whether it's for an investigation or for decision making or both. Yeah, and this gets to the heart, I think, of all of the difficulties we have with capacity assessment for what at what point and the really excellent point also Tara of just because somebody lacks capacity the first question needs to be why and what can we do to restore it to the very best of our ability um, and um, um, and the other thing I'm hearing from everybody is this is going to require some degree of systems change as well um, it's how we think about things and how we do things um, and some of the loads that adult protective services and police and and everybody everybody has you know can can make us up, I think penny wise and pound foolish when it comes to this because I think Patty some of the data you showed us um, with your model is that it actually reduces burdens on the system and improves quality of life for people um, but. Um, we're just not right now in a society where we have that sort of uh, long-term perspective, I think, and makes it hard for us to think that way. Um, what I'd like to do in the final few minutes of the panel is, is um, ask you all to comment on that. We're, we're, I'm gonna put, ask to have our, these guidelines uh, put back up on the screen so that people can see sort of how we're thinking about things and some of the suggestions being made um, related to person-centeredness. Um, again, inviting people to comment on it and inviting you to comment on it as well. Um, what are your thoughts as we look at some of these, you know, guidelines or suggestions related to um, person-centeredness in multidisciplinary teams? Do you have any closing thoughts from the panel on this? I'll just chime in. Um, I, I think that they're a, a wonderful framework, uh, a wonderful set of guidelines. Um, <clears throat> and e although they were certainly put together with MDTs in mind, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, as we as a, as a field and as a system are moving more towards person-centered approaches, person-centered philosophies, uh, I would say not everyone in their own in uh, individual organizations has yet caught up to uh, to incorporating them really into processes, practices, uh, guiding documentation. Um, so while I think this is a wonderful set of, of guidelines for MDT specifically, so many of them can also be applied to individual organizations in their day-to-day -day operations to the extent that they would like to incorporate find, uh, person-centeredness 
and in doing so, uh, it would hopefully elevate and further enable the MDTs that, that those individuals sit on to pursue these person-centered ends. I would just underscore um, one of the, I mean, I, I, I think they're, they're a great set of guidelines um, and I can see practices attached to all of them, both um, as Zach noted for individual agencies, but also collectively as an MDT. Um, the one I wanna hold up is leveraging local community, faith, familial and friend networks to support clients goals and safety plans. What we know about um, our clients, and I would suspect this is true for folks in the audience is they tend to be um, socially isolated um, and social isolation and loneliness is a common factor among the clients that we see. Um, and uh, which is also can also be a risk factor, right, for um, exploitation or abuse. So one of the, I think the most powerful things we can do is really look to the community and sometimes unlikely um, unlikely advocates exist out there um, to support clients and really e expanding the network of folks that support the clients that we see, I think is a really um, powerful way to, to promote um, person-centered work. I think there, there are hidden resources that can support clients in ways that we may not be able to in our professional capacity. And I think reaching out to those folks and broadening networks is really, really important. Thank you. Um, before uh, before I, I have a few closing thoughts, I want to, number one, thank this fabulous panel. Um, really appreciate your, your insight and sharing your expertise and helping us think out loud. I think it was fantastic to hear. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Madge now, and then I'll come back in and wrap it up and stay tuned because I'll, I'll also be making an exciting announcement. Ooh, what could that be? <laughs> thank you, Dr. Mosqueda, and thank you, panelists. Um, if you're like me, all the participants in the audience, I wish I had like hours more to listen and to learn um, from this group and um, was just really inspired, as I hope you were, and informed um, by what they shared in their conversation and discussion. So, um, Thank you all um, for the way that you shared the vulnerability and sharing your, your own experiences and challenges um, and also offering um, some solutions, uh, not all the solutions, but some possibilities because sometimes we forget what is possible when we focus so much on the barriers. Um, so appreciate all of that. Um, our last final poll question for the audience today is, um, Based on what you have heard and considering the person-centered approaches and the information that you heard today, what are one to two actions that you can take to implement in your MDT practice? So again, one or two actions that you can take um, to implement in your MDT practice. So we'll take a few minutes and see what folks are offering for your thoughts. Include the client. Mm -hmm. Have the routine reflect the community. Uh, remind MDT members of the client's right to self-determination. Patients um, have supportive decision-making and include that. Humanize them, use their names. Um, simple, but an effective reminder. That's a very, it seems pretty um, basic, but I love the way that you describe that. Sometimes we don't. Um, tap hidden resources in the community. Try to focus more on being an advocate for my client and on their strengths. Thank you. Hope with exclamation points. That means keeping that alive. Um, be more strengths-based, arrive at the table um, with what the older adult has already voiced to me about their desires. Thank you for that. Um, Person-led and supported decision-making. Again, those are uh, 
additional comments and that really stuck for folks, it seems. Uh, reinforce the individual's right to choose, communicate outcomes of individuals staffed at the MDT. Take into consideration that these are people and not just cases. A number of comments around really that humanizing, remembering whole people, not just problems, as I think Patty said earlier. Um, help providers with remembering client self-determination, involve law enforcement pa uh, partners, not to leave anyone out in terms of this uh, practice and this approach. Um, asking what's working. When has OA been successful? What worked then and what was in place with the older adult um, and what was thriving? Um, ask what's working. That's something we do in our organization. Start with that. What are the assets that the person brings already and how can we do more of that? Uh, make sure that you verify that someone really has cognitive incline, decline instead of just trusting in the family statements. Um, so many um, comments around that um, that we need to investigate further um, so that we really have um, reason to make sure that we're ma maximizing a person's ability, not just looking at their decline. Okay, um, restorative justice piece. It's a powerful story from Margaret. Thank you for acknowledging that. What are the options um, for the older adult? What did they ultimately want? It sounds like for that particular comment. Um, all right. Um, and have cultural sensitivity. I missed that one. So I didn't read every single comment, but I'm I'm reading the comments that people are taking with them steps that either they heard today or were thinking about and are reflecting on and that it's possible for them to, to bring back to their MDTs. And um, I think there's some more conversation pieces and comments in the chat that have been shared today that um, not just captured in the mentee, but certainly captured in how people have been reflecting on uh, the approaches that have been shared um, the information that the panelists shared with us today and the speakers and um, what's possible and getting some juices flowing and great questions around how do we do this in the midst of risk and still stay um, true to what a person really wants and do more of that. So uh, thank you all for your participation and for taking time to engage with our polls and um, for staying attentive and um, engaging in the chat as well. I saw communication among participants with each other, with the panel. It was uh, wonderful to put together and I hope it was useful. And I really think sort of the poco a poco, you know, things need to happen slowly and, and um, but if we don't know about things like person-centered care and that there's actually a process behind it, it's hard to to get closer to doing it. Uh, and uh, somebody mentioned long-term care ombudsman at the end, which, and I'm a volunteer one. So, uh, you know, one thing that's really been drilled home to me in that role is the importance of respecting the client's wishes and autonomy. And so putting all this together and figuring out those balances is tricky, but we have each other to help support us. Um, the um, the exciting announcement is, um, and this is thanks to the Elder Justice Initiative at the Department of Justice and, and really Shelly Jackson leading the way, There's th they are going to be sponsoring an MDT summit, um, which might be spring or a little bit later than that of 2025. So there's going to be more opportunity to talk about these issues. I'm sure that person-centeredness will be one of the several themes um, at, at that summit, but um, but really, um, look look for the announcement about that uh, because they'll be sharing more information and details uh, about that. Um, what if, I mean, I just think it'd be so much fun for a group of us who care about this issue to get together in person. Oh my God, and talk talk about this and, and share ideas and support each other. You will find all these additional resources on MBTs and in person centered practices um, on this slide. Um, and 
this slide along with these resources, along with the other slides in today's recording will be emailed to all of you. There is gonna be a survey at the end of this webinar. Please, 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 your feedback is so important to us. It really helps inform our work, modify what we do. So just take two minutes to, to do that survey to help us out. On behalf of the symposium organizers and the presenters, thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, don't forget to support each other in our, in our work um, and uh, look forward to being in touch with, uh, with many of you in the near future. Best wishes to everyone.